Status is <clears throat> Hello. Yes, ma'am. It's clear, ma'am. Yeah. <clears throat> Today our session is on prosthetic valves, and the lead faculty is Dr. Bhupesh Kumar. Bhupesh Kumar is working as a professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care in Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research, Chandigarh. He is a DM in cardiac anesthesia from Sri Chitra Tirunala Institute in Trivandrum, Kerala. I welcome Dr. Bhupesh to speak on prosthetic valves. Let's start, Dr. Bhupesh. Yeah, yeah thank you so much uh, uh, to the organizers for the opportunity and Dr. Rupa ma'am for a kind introduction. So uh, today uh, I will be speaking on transesophageal echocardiographic examination for the prosthetic valve. So uh, at the end of this talk, you will come to know about the commonly used prosthetic valve design, their echocardiographic characteristic, and how to differentiate pathological from the physiological regurgitation, and examination of prosthetic valve at different locations like erotic mitral and tricuspid and then estimation of the severity of the lesion of the prosthetic valve. So, coming to the different type of prosthetic valve, it can be a bioprosthetic or mechanical or a composite valve, composite graft where valve is mounted on a graft or it can be a homograft. So, bioprosthetic valve can be a stented, a stentless or transcatheter valve, the trans Catheter valve is commonly used for percutaneous implantation that uh, we are commonly using in TAVI. The stented bioprosthetic valve can be a porcine valve where the porcine valve is explanted and it is mounted on a frame. So this frame consists of uh, metallic uh, uh, it act, a stent which acts as a commissure and there is swing ring which is suited to the native of the uh, annulus. Also, instead of porcine uh, valve, there can be a pericardial tissue can be used for preparing the valve tissue and it can be mounted on a frame. So in that case, it becomes a pericardial bioprosthetic valve. Sorry, sir, to interrupt in between, sir. There are two black patches are coming on the screen, sir. Can you minimize the black patches, sir, please? This one? Yes, sir. Just minimize this one, sir, both. But this, yes, sir. Now this one also. This. Okay. Left one also, sir. One more patches is coming, sir. I don't know. This is uh, on my screen. There is nothing. Okay. Due to network issue, sir. Can you share your screen once again, sir, please? Due to a network issue, it coming maybe because whatever so, written content is there. Unshare and then share. Yes, sir. Unshare the screen and share once again, sir. Okay. Um.
I'm stopped and sharing. So should I share again? No? Yes, sir, please. Now you just this is okay. This, uh, you just close this one. Yes, yes sir. Yeah. Now it's coming perfect. Sir. Please continue, sir. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the other can be a stentless bioprosthetic valve where there is no stent, like you see in uh, uh, Medtronic Freestyle or St. Jude uh, Toronto SPV valve. So you can implant one or two size larger valve. There will be increase in effective orifice area and decrease in gradient, and also there will be less stress on the leaflets. So, however, it requires more complicated surgery. In a mechanical valve, it can be a bi-leaflet valve like Sandwood valve where you have two semicircular uh, leaflets which is uh, attached to the peri with the hinge and you have three orifices, one central, a smaller orifice and two larger orifices. Other can be a single leaflet or tilting disc valve like TTK Chitra valve or Metronic Hall valve where the single disc tilts to close and open the valve. Here you have one larger orifice and one a smaller orifice. And then you can have a ball cage valve where the puppet ball is caged and this is a star Edward valve with this valve is hardly used these days. So coming on to the echographic, uh, echocardiographic assessment, you can examine with the 2D, then you can put color Doppler and then you can use 3D and you can assess hemodynamics parameter using Doppler and always look for the collateral damage to the corresponding chambers of the prosthetic valve. So in the 2D, first you should look for what type of valve is this, whether it is a bioprosthetic valve or is a mechanical valve. So uh, then you should look for is the valve seated well, like in erotic positions, if there is rocking motion that suggests dehiscence, while in mitral position, the increased mobility can be because of preservation of the posterior mitral leaflets during the surgery. However, if you find gap between the annulus and the swing ring, that suggests dehiscence. Also, if there is thickening in the leaflets, in case of bio, uh, biological valve, that suggests the primary failure. And uh, then you should look whether leaflets are moving uh, appropriately or not. So like in this case, valve, one leaflet is not moving. That may be because of stuck valve, but before you comment on this, it should be commented after coming off bypass. Then you should look for whether there is any extraneous mass present, like is there any thrombus, vegetations, or pinus. And then always look for the corresponding size and their function. So uh, coming on to what type of valve is this? Like in this case, uh, the leaflets appears to be an, like a native leaflet, but you see a stent and the shadowing because of that. And also in short axis, you can see the a stent. So this is a bioprosthetic stented valve. Here you can see two uh, larger orifice and one a smaller orifice. That means this is a mechanical bi-leaflet valve. And while here you see one larger orifice and one a smaller orifice, that means this is a tilt into this valve. Now we should look whether a valve is positioned in anatomic position or anti-anatomic position. So an anatomic position is when you implant processes commissure along the native valve commissures. And the greater orifice in case of tilting this valve should be on the posterior side. If it is on posterior side, it becomes anatomic. While when it goes to the anterior side, it becomes uh, anti-anatomic position. Or in case of wide lifted valve, the prosthetic commissure is perpendicular to the native valve commissure. So next thing is to look for the any extraneous mass. It can be a pinus, thrombus, or vegetation. In case of pinus, usually it forms after around a year of, of the implantation of valve. It will be a smaller in size and mostly it will have more eco-dense character. Mostly it involves the suture line and there will be centripetal growth. Also, you can find in the CT uh, high attenuation value. It, if it is more than 200, that suggests a pinus. While in the thrombus, there will be a strong relation with the anticoagulation. Mostly it forms in the uh, commodity forms in the tricuspid valve. It will be larger in size and independent motions will be seen. 
so also it will have less ecogenicity and the ct attenuation ratio will be less while the vegetations uh, will be have irregular shape and it will be have clinical feature suggestive of infective endocarditis and the motion will be independent of the motion of the uh, native bulb tissue so then you can put color doppler and see whether the color flow is normal or is there any turbulence and then you, you should look for whether washing jet is present or not so the normal washing jet uh, helps in recognition of the fall then uh, we should look for whether there is any intravascular pathological regurgitation so in this case valve has torn and there is regurgitation from the inside the valve tissues so this is because of intravalvular pathological regurgitation also you should look for any paravalvular leakage so uh, then uh, coming on to the uh, normal signature jet uh, this helps in recognition of the valve like in case of sandwich valve there will be one central jet and may two or maybe more than two lateral small jets while in case of metronic hall valve there will be large central jet you may not find any uh, closing jet in case of a star edward valve so now uh, to uh, differentiate from the physiologic versus the pathological regurgitation normal uh, regurgitation or physiological regurgitation will be of shorter duration it will be of less velocity and uniform color while the if continuous wave doppler will have low signal strength while all pathological regurgitation will be deeply penetrating in nature it will be high velocity non homogeneous jet will be there there might be a pija formation on the proximal part and if if you find anything which is outside the swing ring that is always a pathological regurgitation so you can examine with the 3d uh, 3d uh, narrow angle can be used or commonly 3d zoom uh, mode is used or you may acquire full volume acquisition so the advantage is it give it provides you excellent spatial imaging and in in fast view uh, it's you can exactly pin point from where the pathological regurgitation is arising also you can crop from the ventricular side or any other side uh, to see the uh, from the different uh, angles so the limitation is it provides poor temporal resolution and also the tissue drop out may not be recognized and also it lacks tissue characterization so another important uh, phenomena is pressure recovery phen phenomena so as you know when uh, the flow passes through the smaller orifice the velocity is high but as it proceeds towards the larger uh, area the flow velocity decreases the kinetic energy dissipates and the pressure gradient decreases so this is important particularly in case of if the ascending rotor uh, size is less than 3 cm in that case it might give a pseudo high pressure gradient so it is commonly seen in the aortic position if ascending rotor size is less it is hardly seen in case of mitral position because lv size is really larger also it can be observed when you pass continuous wave doppler through the smaller orifice so if you pass continuous wave align continuous wave doppler through this a small orifice it will give pseudo high pressure gradient and it will underestimate the effective orifice area now uh, you should know about the two uh, orifices like geometric orifice which is the anatomic orifice which can be measured uh, by knowing the internal diameter of the valve and the another is effective orifice area which is a physiological parameter which is derived from with the hydraulic principle and it is the actual flow area or the narrowest vena contracta uh, through which the flow is actually happening so it has been found to have very good correlation with the pressure gradient across the valve Uh, with the effective orifice area while the geometric orifice area there was hardly any correlation with the pressure gradient now coming on to the evaluation of different uh, prosthetic valve first at aortic uh, valve position so the different views for examination of valve of the prosthesis valve is same as that of native valve and also the criteria for estimation of severity remains more or less same as that of native valve so in case of aortic valve positions you can examine with the 2d in different view like mid esophageal five chamber view mid esophageal aortic short axis view mid esophageal aortic long axis view or transgastric long axis view and deep transgastric view which is particularly useful if there is prosthesis is present in the mitral position 
so it, it the shadowing effect of the mantle processes is not uh, does not happens with the deep transgastric position and you can very well see the lip rate motion also you can align the doppler across uh, the erotic wall and measure the gradient you can measure the 3d using multiple uh, 3d modes or 3d zoom mode to have a very good uh, spatial orientation so uh, coming to the uh, doppler examinations uh, as I said, you can align continuous web Doppler in the uh, across the erotic processes and you can measure the gradient using uh, the modified uh, knowledge equation. However, always take into account that if there is narrowing in the LVOT and the velocity in the LVOT is high, higher, so this should be deduced from the velocity across the prosthesis valve. Also, this is a flow dependent parameter. So anything which increases the cardiac output will uh, increase the gradient across the prosthesis. So you should look for the flow independent indices like the contour of jet, acceleration time, effective orifice area or dimension velocity index we will come uh, one by one. So in case of normal processes, the shape will be triangular both in case of pulse wave Doppler and in case of the uh, uh, continuous wave Doppler. While in case of uh, prost uh, astronautic processes, it becomes a parabolic because there is increase in acceleration time so acceleration time increases and it becomes late peaking, so it becomes a parabolic. Since the acceleration time is dependent on the heart rate, the ratio of acceleration time to the ejection time, if it is more than 0.4, that suggests acenosis in the prosthesis. Another parameter is Doppler velocity index, which is a ratio of the velocity in the LVOT to the velocity across the prosthesis. Normally, if it is more than uh, 0.3, so if it is less than 0.25, that suggests a asnosis in the prosthesis. So it is particularly useful if we are not able to measure the uh, diameter in the LVOT or the size of the valve. So if this is a dimensionless because this is a ratio of the two velocities. Next, you can measure the effective orifice area by using the continuity equation, which states that the, the flow at two points, like in this case, uh, flow, uh, stroke volume at the LVOT will be equal to the stroke volume across the erotic valve. So you can uh, measure the stroke volume in the LVOT by measuring the cross-sectional area of the LVOT and VTI in the LVOT that you can uh, you can measure the cross-sectional area in the medial superior long axis view. And then you can measure the VTI in the LVOT by putting uh, pulse wave Doppler in the deep transgastic view and tracing this envelope will give you the VTI and multiplication of cross section area and the VTI will give you the stroke volume. And you can divide this with the VTI across the prosthesis valve that you can get by uh, tracing the envelope of the continuous wave Doppler in the uh, obtained from the deep transgastic view. So this will uh, give you the effective orifice area in, of the erotic valve. So uh, if you find uh, these parameters like mean gradient more than 35, dimensionless velocity index less than 0.25 or the effective orifice area less than 0.8 and round symmetric contours with the acceleration time more than 100, uh, that suggests that there is significant astenosis in the prosthesis. So if you find high velocity or high gradient, then the next thing you should look for the dimensions velocity index if it is normal and the contour is triangular, accession time is less than 100, that suggests the processes is normal. However, if you find the dimensional velocity index is less than 0.25 and the, it becomes a parabolic acceleration time is more than 100, that suggests the astenosis. If there is discrepancy between the uh, DVI and the shape of the, uh, and the accession time uh, across the processes, that means that it may be because of the flow acceleration in the LVOT. So uh, if gradient is high, you can measure the effective orifice area and you can index that to the body surface area. If it is less than 0.85, that suggests mild to moderate uh, patient prosthetic mismatch. And if it is less than 0.65 centimeter uh, per meter square, that suggests severe patient prosthetic mismatch. So uh, prosthetic uh, erotic valve regurgitation, you can like a native valve, you can uh, look into the medial filer erotic long axis view where you can measure the jet width and the jet width to the LVOT ratio. However, it may not be possible if there is mitral prosthesis uh, is present. 
so in that case because of shadowing this may not be feasible also when a contractor measurement sometimes becomes difficult because of eccentric nature of the when a contractor or if there is mitral prosthesis is present in the uh, mitral position so you can measure the mediastinal erotic short axis view and if you see the rocking motion that suggest there is a dehiscence and while putting the color if you find the neck of the color jet if it is more than 20% that suggests the severe uh, erotic regurgitation then you can uh, in the deep transgastric view you can put continuous wave doppler and measure the uh, pressure half time if it is less than 200 that suggests the severe erotic regurgitation also in case of uh, uh, descending thoracic rota you can put pulse wave doppler and if you find the hollow diastolic flow reversal that suggests the severe erotic regurgitation so these are parameter i have already said if you find the dense continuous wave doppler contour pressure time is less than 200 if you find hollow diastolic flow reversal in the descending thoracic rota these are severe erotic regurgitation also you can measure the regurgitant volume and regurgitant fraction the next is the prosthetic uh, mitral valve uh, you the views are same that of the native valve so you can get it in the mediastinal four chamber view two chamber view and the mediastinal long axis view also you can get transgastric basal short axis view or transgastric two chamber view and deep transgastric views so uh, 3d views uh, particularly is important 3d infas view which gives you very nice uh, spatial orientation you can Uh, correlate the finding with the erotic wall or the uh, uh, from the appendage and you can pinpoint and uh, communicate directly to the surgeons so uh, in the doppler examinations we can measure the peak e velocity and the mean gradient by putting the continuous wave doppler however as i said the doppler uh, continuous wave doppler should not pass through the central orifice and also this is a load dependent parameters so anything which increases the cardiac output will increase the gradient you can measure the pressure half time uh, by uh, tracing uh, the slope of the envelope and if you can get the mitral valve area by this formula 220 by pressure half time this this is particularly valid in if there is moderate to severe mitral stenosis while measuring uh, doppler parameters Uh, you should also look for the collateral damage you should look uh, for the lv size and their functions similarly rv size and their functions and estimate the press, uh, pulmonary artery pressure so dimension less velocity index can be measured as so this is a ratio of vti across the prosthetic valve to the vti across the lvot so normally it is less than 2.2 so if it is more than 2.5 that suggests that is stenosis in the prosthesis similarly you can measure the effective orifice area by continuity equations so if there is absence of mitral regurgitation or erotic regurgitation so you can uh, get the uh, lvot stroke volume by multiplying the cross sectional area of the lvot into the vti of the lvot and divide to this is the vti across the prosthesis that you can get by putting the continuous wave topless so uh, uh, again you need to avoid the central orifice for the continuous wave doppler measurement so if the parameters is like this if you get the mean gradient of more than 10 the doppler velocity index more than 2.5 effective orifice area less than 1 and the pressure half time more than 200 that suggests significant stenosis in the prosthesis so uh, you can uh, measure uh, the effective orifice area and index to the body surface area so as you can see if the uh, it is 1.2 and uh, more than that the press, uh, systolic pressures were uh, largely normal and there was a significant increase as it decreases so less than 1.2 uh, suggests the mild to moderate patient prosthetic mismatch in case of mitral position and if it is less than 0.9 that suggests severe patient prosthetic mismatch for the mitral valve now uh, looking at the mitral valve degeneration uh, this should be examined uh, from four chamber view and the angle should be gradually increased from 0 to 180 degree to localize the site of uh, regurgitant orifice or paravascular valvular leakage 
Also, you can measure the transgastric basal short axis view and the transgastric two chamber view. 3D inverse view will again uh, will very useful in localizing the site of paravalvular regurgitation, and uh, this gives very good uh, spatial orientation. So, if, if you get again the dense continuous wave Dopplers, yearly peaking triangulars, jet in the continuous wave Doppler, if you, if you find pulmonary venous flow reversal in the systole, the vena contacta is more than six. So these suggest the severe mitral degradation across the paravalvular uh, leakage. Also, you can measure the regurgitant volume and regurgitant for uh, uh, regurgitation fraction. So uh, in uh, tricuspid valves, the views for examinations uh, would be a mediastrophagal four chamber view, mediastrophagal inflow outflow view, mediastrophagal uh, modified by cable view and the transgastric inflow outflow view. So uh, like a mitral, uh, you can uh, put the continuous wave doppler and measure the gradient. Also, uh, you should always look for the collateral damage like RV functions, right atrial size, inferior vena cava size and their response to the uh, respiration and flow reversal in the hepatic vein. So uh, you can measure the continuous uh, Continuity with the continuity equation effective or face area if there is no tricuspid regurgitation. So, if there is no erotic regurgitation, the erotic uh, LVOTs can be used as a uh, reference point. So, you can measure stroke volume at the LVOT. However, if there is erotic regurgitation, in that case, pulmonary analysis should be used as a reference point to measure the uh, stroke volume and then you can devise the uh, uh, velocity across the prosthesis across the tricuspid valve and then that will give you the effective orifice area. So if you find the mean gradient more than 6 and the pressure half time more than 230, that suggests significant tricuspid stenosis. In tricuspid degradation, uh, if you vena contacta is more than 7 and if you find holosystolic reversals in the hepatic, hepatic flow, then uh, it suggests the significant or severe tricuspid regurgitation. So now the patient prosthetic mismatch, this was defined by Rahim Tulla in 1978. Uh, it states that patient prosthetic mismatch occurs when the effective orifice area of the prosthesis is too small in relation to the body size that results in abnormally high post-operative gradients. So the area becomes uh, too uh, small for the supply needed for the body. And uh, the effect of patient prosthetic mismatch in case of erotic positions, the short term effect was found to be particularly uh, very significant if there is ejection fractions were less than 40%. And these patients with uh, less than 40% ejection fraction were showing short term mortality. In the long terms, the severe patient prosthetic mismatch was associated with the decreased survival rate. In case of mitral positions, the patient prosthetic mismatch was associated with the post persistent post operative pulmonary hypertension, and in case of severe patient prosthetic mismatch, it was associated with the late survival, uh, decreased late survival. So, this is a chart which shows the effective orifice area. Uh, of the different type of wall with the different size that helps in recognition of uh, selection of the different type of wall which is needed for the patients. So uh, the simple uh, steps which uh, can avoid the patient prosthetic mismatch is the, the first thing we need to know the patient body surface area and with the body surface area we can uh, using the reference table we can uh, know about the how much effective orifice area is needed for that patient and you can select from the chart uh, for this effective orifice area which type and size of valve will be suitable and that can be implanted. So if it is not possible to do that, in that case other uh, uh, procedures like erotic root enlargement or supraannular implantation of the valve or use of a stentless bioprosthetic valve or use of homograft can be done. So the, at the end, the take of uh, masses is evaluation of prosthetic valve uh, is challenging because of the presence of uh, art artifact and the shadowing effect. 
the color flow dopplers may be impaired because of shadowing however the spectral doppler remains unaffected so it remains useful the transgastric view for the erotic prosthesis as is particularly useful to recognize the motion and measurement of the uh, doppler uh, gradient for the erotic wall 3d in first view provide excellent spatial localization and communication with the surgeons moderate and severe patient prosthetic mismatch causes increased mortality particularly in patient with the low ejection fraction less than uh, 40% and patient prosthetic mismatch can be easily prevented by selecting most appropriate type and size of prosthesis according to the target index effective orifice area. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bhupesh. I think you have covered almost everything. And very clearly presented. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Are there any doubts? Any questions? Uh, it was a lovely presentation. Thank you, Bhupesh, for joining us. And uh, I would like to especially thank you and Rupa for having agreed to participate in the Sunday tea breakfast session. Thank you very much. If there are any questions, please address them. Yeah, thanks, sir. Good morning, sir. Nice presentation, sir, Dr. Bhupesh. You explained us the entire uh, this one. What are all the types of uh, prosthetic, bio, uh, bio prosthetic, and all? Now, question is, uh, uh, when you, when you, go, uh, how are you going to assess the paravalvular leak of the mitral, and when are you going to address it? Para, well, yeah. leak. So, uh, paravalvular leakage. Uh, first thing is to recognize that whether it is a. Uh, uh, physiological washing jet or it is a paravalvular leakage that differentiation is needed so uh, most of the time if you find anything which is uh, outside the swing ring it will be a paravalvular leakage as i have told you earlier there will be increase in velocity you might find find pizza in the proximal part of the paravalvular leakage it will be high velocity highly turbulent jet so that way you can recognize uh, paravalvular leakage the next thing comes to localize that paravalvular leakage and whether this paravalvular leakage is significant or not. So that you can uh, see uh, with the kind of uh, uh, resistant jet, how much is the vena contract uh, of that resistant jet and uh, you can, um, uh, with vena contract you can, you will be able to roughly estimate how much is the uh, paravalvular leakage. If it is, uh, ideally speaking, paravalvular leakage, if it is anything more than mild, needs to be addressed. So, uh, more than mild. Okay. Yeah. Any difference in the by leaflets and uh, because they say that the gradients and all increases with the by leaflets. By leaflets well. I other, get, other question, other question, sir. Uh, no, uh, I could not understand what you want to uh, ask. So, uh, gradient increases in the valve. No, no, yeah, you told no that uh, various types of other valves, prosthetic yeah. valves. Yeah. So, yeah. by leaflets, how are you going to solve? Because you said that the gradients uh, and all according to this uh, PPM will occur. No, why leaflet valve, uh, in, if, if you are asking about the gradients, so uh, mm. uh, the only thing uh, you need to take care while measuring the gradient, the continuous wave Doppler should not pass through the central orifice of the while leaflet valve. So you, you align such that uh, uh, it passes through the larger orifice. If it is not possible, you can use pulse wave Dopplers also. And uh, regarding the prosthetic, uh, this one, pressure of time, is it so for uh, even for prosthetic uh, valve also? 
what we take uh, normal uh, this one for mitral stenosis and all pressure of time same value to be taken about 220 divided yeah so uh, in case of erotic position it is same uh, however when while measuring the uh, pressure half time you should uh, look for whether there is other uh, pathological uh, regurgitation uh, present or not like if you are measuring across the mitral positions there should not be erotic regurgitation should not be there so if it is present that might affect the values of uh, pressure half time thank you sir Bupesh, can I make one comment? Yes, sir. Yeah, please, sir. Uh, see, the pressure half time is usually described uh, for the mitral valve regurgitation. So, if the pressure half time is uh, basically, it is if the valve orifice is more than 1.5, yes. it will be determined mm -hmm. more by the compliance of the LA and the LV rather than the stenosis of the valve. That's so, correct. If the uh, pressure half time is less than 130, then only it will come into a picture. Otherwise, if the pressure of time is more than 130, it is not a reliable parameter. Because it will be determined only by the LA and LV. Uh, so that's why it says that is... Uh, say, uh, it is not uh, significant. Uh, pressure of time yeah. is not significant with respect to the uh, prosthetic, uh, this one. Uh, so because of this kind of... Is, they have decided the guidelines, uh, the American guidelines have described pressure half time only if it is less than 130, 130 yes. milliseconds. Yeah. So, so only for moderate or severe. Less than 130, the value area will be more. If the value area is less than 1.5, I mean, uh, uh, it should be more than 130, then only it will be significant. That means the value area is narrower uh, than 1.5. Hello. Uh, yes. Good morning, uh, Rupa. <laughs> nice to meet you again. Uh, um, Bupesh, it was uh, really, as uh, Dr. Rupa said, it was really comprehensive and you covered almost everything. It's, it's a difficult subject. Um, one uh, question, uh, when will you address uh, uh, thrombus surgically? Okay, so uh, thrombus, if it is uh, of large size, most of the small size thrombus uh, is taken care of by the anticoagulations. If it is large size and progressing with the anticoagulation treatment as well, then that is the need. Uh, I think it is more than 10 millimeters, if I'm not wrong. Uh, zero, 0 0.85 centimeter square size. size. Yeah. If it is more than 0 0.85, uh, one can sh should not waste time in uh, anticoagulation. I mean, when, uh, because then you can't go on pump, isn't it? So one has to go for surgery. Uh, yeah. Another, uh, I, I don't know whether you have covered it because I wasn't there for a short while. Uh, how would you prevent PPM? Because it must be prevented rather than uh, later on, uh, you know, repenting. So, is there anything to prevent PPM? So, I I, I had uh, yeah, uh, this, I, I must this. have missed it um, because I wasn't. So, there for uh, first thing we need to know how what is the body surface area of the patients. Then we need to know how much effective orifice area is needed for that, and then we can select different type and the size of valve from the available chart. And that valve, if it is implanted, th this should prevent the. Uh, patient prosthetic mismatch. If it is not feasible to implant that size and type of valve, in that case, the other surgical method like erotic root enlargement, supranular enlargement, all these things can be tried. If the LV size is uh, small uh, comparatively, uh, when compared what, to... What are the vulnerability of hmm. PPM? There must be many points for... Uh, Sometimes, though effect or if I, this one, uh, surface area, everything is fine. But LV is low, though you, LV is less comparatively for that particular individual. So during that time, um, usually go for. So what I felt is uh, in the aortic area, 
you have to select little larger to prevent the uh, this one ppm so little uh, larger uh, than the what the expected size no. the important thing is to plan the desired plan. effect mm. surface area to avoid ppm should be calculated before surgery Yes, before the surgery. desired effective orifice area to avoid PPM is calculated before surgery by multiplying patient's body surface area with 0.85 centimeters square. Yes, yes. That 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 formula I just uh, was a uh, uh, you know uh, good. Yes, madam. And yeah. then before. the size and make of the prosthesis that would provide the desired value is selected based on published data by different mal valve manufacturers. So one has to plan beforehand. Since, and there uh, are since, certain, huh, yes, yes. Uh, since uh, this uh, pro uh, prosthetic uh, mismatch, patient prosthetic mismatch is associated with in not only increased operating mortality, but also with the lifespan. Mm -hmm. It is associated with regression of LV mass and it is aggressed, uh, it is associated with decreased long term survival. Mm -hmm. so in fact, it, it injures the upper. Not yeah. only that, it injures the apparatus, mitral or uh, in the, even in the aortic also, it injures. Yes. It blocks. And one, so. Yes. And a very, very important point is that if the aortic annulus is small, severe patient prosthetic mismatch may occur unless the aortic root is enlarged during yes. surgery. So that is very, very important. So, so for that, annulus, annulus must be measured before surgery. Annulus. Yes, yes, hmm. yes, yes. yes, yes. And because the, we it LVOT and uh, aortic root, but uh, many a times annulus is forgotten. Yeah, so we must, uh, uh, as a routine, make it a point to measure the effective, effective orifice area index. So patient hmm. prosthetic mismatch after aortic valve replacement is considered severe if the effective orifice area index is less than 0 0.65 centimeters square per meter square. And mm. if it is a mo it is considered moderate if it is between 0 0.65 centimeters square per meter square and 0 0.85 centimeters square per meter square. If the effective orifice area index is more than or equal to 0 0.85 centimeters square per meter square, then it is not significant. There is no patient prosthetic mismatch. So the key point is to plan beforehand and to sensitize the surgeon uh, if the aortic annulus is small then to sensitize the surgeon to enlarge the aortic root. That mm. is also part of our duty. <laughs> okay, can yeah. I say a few words uh, about this? Uh, see, usually uh, the PPM can be anticipated in the preoperative period, especially mm. if you have a small size patient whose aortic annulus is about, say, 17. The smallest valve that we have is 19. Mm. So uh, usually if the surgeon will not like to overstretch the annulus because it can cause rupture of the annulus. Mm -hmm. So that usually can be predicted preoperatively. Now, the second factor is age of the patient. Say let us have a patient who is young patient who is going to have more active life than another octogenarian who is not uh, going to do much physical exertion. So in octogenarian probably we may accept even severe PPM because his physical activity is limited and he won't have uh, much any symptoms. But if the young patient who is going to have more physical activity, then we may have to address that. Second thing, as the Dr. Bhupesh has already nicely described, the LB function is also equally important. Mm -hmm. So then comes uh, the uh, first is the choice for the surgeon is always superannular implantation. So uh, a surgeon can plan placing the valve above the annulus. But the risk with the superannular implantation is coronary uh, ostia can be compromised. So mm -hmm. sometimes surgeons uh, realize during surgery that the annulus, uh, the, I mean the stain of the process is, is too close to the coronary ostia. So in that case, he has the option of the posterior aortic root enlargement. We have already published from our institute uh, two cases of policy and we have performed about five or six cases. So uh, when the aortic annulus was enlarged in the posterior direction up to the mitral valve annulus. Uh, and uh, then uh, uh, in the enlarged annulus, it could take 19 uh, valve processes. If that is not there, we can also think of using a stateless processes because the size, we can put a little larger size uh, in that case. Uh, so these factors also should be considered. And as Dr. Bhupesh has described, then we have the choice of either going for Ross procedure or putting IoT homogram. So these are also the options. 
can i add something to shrinivas uh, whatever shrinivas had said uh, yeah. uh, this uh, in addition to lv dysfunction left ventricular hypertrophy then patient uh, with mr associated mr in aortic case and paradoxical low flow low gradient these are the cases who are prone for ppm so one should think of little over size or size should be reconsidered before putting it you must have seen Sorry, lot of ppm isn't it ट्वेंटी or sometimes after uh, denudation of the calcification they remove the calcification and then they can place a bigger valve mm -hmm. uh, uh, but if that is not possible technically then he has to think about alternate strategies so uh, exactly that is the ppm is not addressed uh, the uh, symptom like for the for aortic valve the lv hypertrophy may not regress in case of mm -hmm. mitral valve the pulmonary hypertension may not regress Yes. So it has come to us with the symptoms. So we are supposed to address the symptoms. Correct. I think Indians are prone for this because they have small body structure, BSA, and yes. small aortic root and annulus. They are prone for these things. Uh, one, uh, one, one more easy way to identify the uh, Dr. Bhupesh with your permission. Then. A small addition. Uh, the to how to identify the site of paraonal leak. Uh, for example, in the long axis view, this is the, the, described by the Foster et al. But they have described only three views. If you see the mesophageal uh, four views, in the long axis view, if you get a paraonal leak just next to the aorta, it is at 12 o'clock. On the left side of the uh, hand, left hand side, it will be at 6 o'clock. Then if you go to the two chamber view. If you get it next to the LA appendix, it is at 10 o'clock. Opposite side is at 4 o'clock. Then, if you go to commissural view, on the, uh, the uh, next to the P1 side, it will be at 9 o'clock, approximately, and uh, other side it will be 3 o'clock, plus minus one. And then, if you go to four chamber view, then it will be something at around 8 o'clock, and opposite side it will be at around 2 o'clock, plus minus one. Means that's the usual location. Okay. So if you want to locate the exact site of parallel leak in these four views, uh, we can see the site of leak and identify exactly. Uh, if you, unless you have 3D echo, with the 3D echo you can directly see the infa, infa view. But if you have using 2D echo, then using these four views, we can identify the site of uh, parallel leak. In case of aortic valve, it is exactly the upside down. Uh, if you see the aortic valve short axis view uh, in our usual echo. Uh, let us say at uh, 12 o'clock position is the short axis view. If there is a parallel leak, then anatomically it is at six o'clock. This kind of thing will help the surgeon to exactly know where to put the stitch. Hmm. Hmm. Nice. Practical tips. Uh, sir, sir, uh, good morning, sir. Doctor Vijay here. Uh, sir, in 3D, uh, uh, it's much more, uh, uh, you know, uh, very uh, like easy to uh, locate the paraprosthetic leak in mitral. Uh, if you do a Z rotate, uh, that means surgeon's view, then um, the uh, location is uh, like you know, uh, it's like uh, uh, like as if you are looking through the uh, the 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 position of the leak. Or the site of the uh, paraprosthetic leak. Yes, Can you comment on it? Can you comment? Yes, that's true. Actually, and first view or surgical view gives a very good spatial orientation. And you can actually show that uh, image to the surgeon, and he can have a visual impression. That is not possible in case of 2D view. That's, you can get uh, you get idea with the different angle and doc as Dr. Sinivas. Said that it can be converted into different kind of uh, in terms of clock positions. 
but the surgeon will may not have that kind of uh, imagination so the, the, the good point with the three days you can show the pictures directly to the surgeon and he can have direct visual impact so but what sir said is very uh, this one like very uh, informative when you don't have a facility of 3d uh, i think this is the best thing what we can give to the surgeon uh, thank you sir i was not knowing this thank you very much for uh, <laughs> for that particular input <laughs> hello hello yes good morning sir this is dr shanko from kolkata uh, may i know uh, where we can get this clockwise views it was very interesting but somehow i couldn't follow it maybe i was a little slow to catch or dr sini was a little faster than me <laughs> it is described by faster uh, radar they have described three views if you know this four mediastinal views uh, just in my bring the, the uh, long axis view in front of your eyes the aorta is on the right hand side that is at 12 o'clock other side it is 6 o'clock right then once you rotate to two chamber view on the right hand side is the appendix that is usually at around 10 o'clock so other side will become 4 o'clock then if you come to the commissural view the right hand side will be at 9 o'clock other side will become 3 o'clock and if you come to four chamber view the right hand side will become uh, 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 that is 8 o'clock and reverse will be 2 o'clock so you can imagine either right side or left side so from 12 o'clock to uh, 10 o'clock 9 o'clock and 8 o'clock and then other side will be opposite way it uh, just have to simple it, of course with this plus minus one this view will be uh, will be useful if you want to locate the exact site of uh, uh, parallel lead sometimes the surgeons may have difficulty in identifying the lead after uh, giving cardioplegia so we can help the surgeon we can show the surgeon exact site of parallel lead many times surgeons themselves will have idea that they have uh, put the stitches across of uh, calcific areas or he will have uh, some uh, idea about that where exactly the site of parallel lead may be so we can only show the image to him thank you thank you so much sir thank you so much uh, uh, rupa can i uh, say something yes madam please huh. see if there is lot of calcium uh, in aortic valve would you advise ct before going for surgery to know the exact uh, annulus or Sometimes it is full of calcium. Yeah. Usually it can be seen by echo. Peri, how about the periaortic uh, echo? Madam, okay. during intraoperative period, uh, peri, suppose if you suspect uh, this one, periaortic. Yes. रिगार्डिंग पीपीएम आई जस्ट आई जस्ट टू माई नॉलेज टू माई नॉलेज मेजरिंग एनलस विद इज प्रैक्टिस इन केस ऑफ परक्यूटेनियस ट्रांस Uh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. This is not uh, used in case of surgical implantation. Okay, we can take decision on table also. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, surgeon can always put a size and can know how much is the exact size and what uh, mm -hmm. size ball he can fit into it. So that's. So, as as the uh, discussion was there, uh, there the other areas such as the aorta mitral curtain is calcific. Or whether the aortic root is calcific, that is also very important to identify. Hmm. So uh, probably if you suspect severe calcification, porcel and aorta, it may be one of the uh, difficult uh, for a surgeon to repair the uh, or to replace a valve. So it is necessary to identify porcel and aorta. If you have porcel and aorta, then definitely you require radiological investigations. Or if there is severe uh, aorta mitral calcification, uh, it may affect even the mitral valve stability. of 
Yeah, let's come back. Hello. Ah, yeah. Why, why is that? So, so that uh, cases usually uh, Dr. Bhupesh already pointed out that on table, uh, the surgeon himself can take decision about the calcification. So if it is uh, only for the sake of aortic well annulus, probably CT scan will not be required. But for all tally cases, uh, the, they have their own protocols for CT scan protocol. Hello. Any other points for discussion? Super, have you taken the questions from chat box? There are few questions there. Importance of DVI for mitral valve. Karthik uh, Hanuman Shetty has asked Karthik. Importance of DVI so, for mitral valve. So, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, DVI uh, is uh, dimension velocity index. So that is a uh, uh, to measure the velocity across the processes. And uh, the importance would be like uh, if you. Uh, not able to measure the uh, like it will be not affected by uh, any of the flow related uh, parameters because it's a dimensionless so uh, that way it uh, it has little edge over the measurement of stenosis that thing yeah. uh, as bupesh said the dvi is VTI, in the case of mitral valve it is vti prosthetic mitral valve divided by vti lvot and in the case of aortic valve, it is the opposite. So that should be remembered. And in the case of mitral valve, if the DVI, DVI is considered normal if it is less than 2.2. And there is significant, significant prosthetic stenosis if the DVI is more than 2.5. In the case of aortic valve, if the DVI DVI is considered if the DVI is less than 0.25, there is significant prosthetic aortic stenosis. So, in the case of aortic valve, DVI is considered normal if it is equal to or more than 0.3, while in the case of mitral valve, DVI is considered normal, that is, there is no prosthetic mitral stenosis if the DVI is less than 2.2. So, these values it is important to remember. Or anything you can uh, you can think, madam. Anything less than 0.25, there is a PPM. Normally, it is one DVI. No, normally accept, it madam? is different for mitral valve, mitral valve prosthesis, yeah. and aortic valve prosthesis. In the case of mitral valve, DVI is if the DVI if the mitral if the prosthetic mitral valve is not stenosed then we should get a DVA of less than 2.2. While no. in the case of aortic valve, if the prosthetic aortic valve is not stenosed, then we should get a DVA equal to or more than 0.3. So in the case of aortic valve, DVA should be equal to or more than 0.3 if there is no stenosis. While in the case of mitral valve, DVA should be less than 2.2 if there is no stenosis. So this value should be impr imprinted in the mind. Therefore, in the case of mitral valve, there is significant stenosis if the DVI is more than 2.5. In the case of aortic valve, there is significant stenosis if the DVI is less than 0.25. So this values should be imprinted in our mind, and we should make it a point to measure the effective to measure the DVI. And remember that when you are measuring DVI in the case of mitral valve, it is VTI prosthetic mitral valve divided by VTI LVOT. While in the case of aortic valve, you keep you put the VTI of the prosthetic aortic valve in the denominator and not in the numerator. 
that is very Madam, important uh, vti of the aortic uh, wall uh, this one mm -hmm. there, there is a little uh, this one confusion what you said there is there is must be a minus of the valve, vti of the valve no confusion the aortic valve confusion wall. for see for dvi of the mitral valve it is vti prosthetic mitral valve divided by vti lvot in the case of aortic valve it is the reverse that is the vti of the prosthetic aortic valve you are putting in the denominator okay. and in the numerator is vti lvot that is all plus you should remember the values also the normal values and or, or when you consider it significant stenosis that values we have to remember I so, uh, normally speaking, the LBOT VTI is less. So, normally it is one third of the uh, velocity across the aortic valve. So, you get normal value of DVI, which is the velocity time integral of LBOT divided by VTI in of across, across the aortic valve. It will be normally less than 0.3. If you if it is less than 0.25, that suggests significant stenosis. While in case of mitral prosthesis. Since VTI cross processes comes as a nominator and across LBOT goes as a denominator, it is more than 2.2. No. Got it? No, it is reverse. Yes, yes. yes. See, this uh, other parameters uh, that we see uh, the DVI, effective orifice area, and the acceleration time, these parameters are uh, not totally flow independent, they are less flow dependent. If you see the American Society guidelines, it is it is less flow dependent. It is not flow independent. Now, in case of aortic valve, the LBOT stroke volume will go into aortic valve in the same cardiac cycle. That is why these parameters are of very importance in case of aortic valve. Because uh, Srinivas, we are not able to hear you. Hello. Ah, now we can. Okay, yes. 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 Yeah. Ah, now we can. Yes. So because the uh, uh, stroke volume is ejected in the from the LBOT to the aorta, uh, this is very important. Now, basically, we have to come into the flow less flow dependent parameters only if your peak velocity in and mean gradients are high. So this peak velocity and mean gradient can be high. Because of two main reasons. One is high cardiac output itself, as in post bypass period, there is hemodilution and use of inotropes will increase the cardiac output. Second situation is in the significant parallelly. So that may a regurgitation that may increase the flow across the valve. Now, in this situation, in case, let us say, in case of mitral valve, if the peak velocity is more than two meters, in case of aortic valve, peak velocity is more than three or the mean gradient more than 5 in case of mitral valve uh, or 20 in case of aortic valve. Now, whether uh, it's the stenosis or not, for that purpose, we have these three parameters. That is acceleration time, uh, the uh, DVI, and the uh, effective uh, regression uh, office area. Srinivas, so sir, yeah. one moment. Let Bhupesh show that uh, uh, beautiful uh, flow chart which he had shown for this, what you are explaining. Yeah, it's that is given in the American society. Yes, yes, it's a you. You yes. please speak when this is uh, getting. Yeah. You know, sir, uh, Doctor Srin was one more point is. Ah, this the this graph. One. The graph yes. will. Uh, this will is a be beautiful changed. chart. Uh, Parabolic. Now, so now, if we have high flow, if we have high flow across a mitral or aortic valve, it may artificially increase the peak velocity and the mean gradient. In now whether this stenosis is there or not. To distinguish this thing, we have these parameters. That is the DVI, the acceleration time, and the regression orifice area. If it, or effective regression orifice area. Now, in case of aortic valve, the stroke volume is combined for LBOT and aortic valve. In the same cardiac cycle, you get both. In case of mitral valve, uh, uh, these are in different cardiac cycles. You cannot measure the mitral valve inflow and LBOT outflow in the same cardiac cycle if you are on major parameters. That is why. These three parameters are more popular or more reliable in case of aortic valve. In case of mitral valve, because they are measured in different cardiac cycles, uh, usually these parameters may be a fraught with many inaccuracies. 
because the DVI, what you get in mitral valve is first the VTI of the mitral valve and then you have to come to the VTI of the aortic valve. They are separate cardiac cycles. That is why uh, the DVI of the mitral valve is not very reliable parameter uh, for assessment of cirrhosis. Usually it is a peak velocity, the mean gradient, and you can also see the pulmonary, uh, what is uh, the pressure half time uh, in case of uh, uh, the severe refrigeration. Otherwise, it's a clinical judgment and other findings, supportive findings, they will be more reliable. We have given, given values, uh, but they might be sometimes substantial errors because uh, they are majorly different cardiac cycles. So, DVI, as he has mentioned in the mitral valve, uh, more than uh, 2.5 will suggest the prostatic valve cirrhosis. Uh, as the defective orifice area, also. Uh, as here, Dr. Bhupesh has already mentioned, more than 1.2 meter square suggests absence of uh, cirrhosis. Less than that 1.2 means it will be cirrhosis. And also, you can make out eyeballing with the graph, sir, circular or parabolic. It yeah. indicates yeah, yeah, the yeah. Other, po other point. Yeah. Basically, it, told... biological, it is the acceleration time and EG acceleration. EG. So, either 80 or 80 upon 80. If 80 is less than 80 milliseconds, it uh, rules out the presence of any uh, uh, say possible stenosis. More than 100 is more suggestive of uh, uh, stenosis. 80 upon 80, more than 40 also suggests uh, possible stenosis. Um, I have a simple message. That is, whenever an, uh, whenever an anesthetist is involved in a valve replacement case, E, e, every anesthesia echocardiographer should measure the DVI and the effective office area and index the effective office area to the body surface area because we have al already discussed that if, if when there is severe patient prosthetic mismatch, the effective office area index will be less than 0 0.65 centimeters square per meter square. So these things every anesthetist echocardiographer should do. Measure DVI, measure effective office area, and index the effective office area with the body surface area. That is a simple message for today. Other parameter is uh, stroke volume less than 30 ml and the peak uh, the peak velocity is yes. more than uh, that also they take it. Yes, yes. Ml. See that we invariably do. We always measure the gradient. We always measure the velocities that we always do. But we should also do the DVI yes, effect F. office area and index it. Velocity and uh, gradient, all of us always do. And we will also look for paravalvular leaks, etc. But this also should be done, DVI yes. and EOA, and index it. Any other points? Madam, in a Ross procedure, the gradient and all a little higher side you have to take accepted and the, is it so madam dr bupesh uh, i don't know it's uh, uncommon to see in those procedure the gradient should be high because it's normal per, because usually it will be high that can be taken as uh, normal uh, according to madam's uh, definition it may not be old good in ross procedure because always it will be the gradient will be more the is it so or madam yeah in ross procedure yeah how are you going to grade madam because usually there will be a high gradient comparatively in ross procedure how to grade i have not seen any guidelines so far okay. because they say that you can accept even uh, the gradient is mo little high yeah. Without uh, telling it's a PPM. Okay. Only thing, if, if the effective office area index is above 0.5 yes. meter square per meter square, then we are all happy. If it is between 0 0.65 centimeter square per meter square and 0 0.85 centimeter square per meter square, then we have to consider it as moderate, moderate patient prosthetic mismatch. Okay. 
Murli sir, are you there? Hello? Probably has left, madam. You can conclude, madam, if there is no yeah. question. Yeah. I think uh, hello, hello, Doctor Bupesh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you yeah. want to uh, yeah. say any concluding statement? Oh, it was good. Uh, was nice good. discussion. Uh, so. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity and nice discussion. So thanks again, madam, and thanks to Dr. Molises, although he's not there, but still is uh, good to have uh, uh, on board experienced person and learn about the things. Which yeah, usually Molises gives a very nice concluding statement. OK, thank you, uh, Dr. Bupesh. Nice seeing you also. I didn't meet you during the last uh, T P J. We were online only. So thank you everybody. Thank you, madam, for giving so many suggestions. So shall we? Thank you. Nice to see you, both of you, and Bupesh. Lovely meeting. Um, thanks. Yeah, thanks. So much. thanks. Okay. Thanks to all the others who contributed in the discussion. Thank you. Now let's close. Bye. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah.